introduce my colleague, Jonathan Brewer. He is originally from Ireland, uh, but moved to Denmark when he was 12 and uh, studied uh, um, physics and math at SDU. Then went on to do a PhD in biophysics, which he graduated from in 2007. He stayed on as a postdoc, um, became assistant professor, and uh, recently, in 2016, became associate professor at BMB. So he specialized in various bioimaging technologies, nanotechnologies, um, and he's been one of the driving forces in establishing Gambic, and that, that is the Danish Molecular uh, Biomedical Imaging Center. So this is a trans-faculty center that involving also uh, researchers at Sony. And Jonathan is one of the driving forces, has been one of the driving forces in establishing the center and now also running uh, the center. So he's helping a lot of us with um, a lot of his cool technologies that we will hear more about today. Please. Thank you very much. And so I'd like to start by thanking the people who have organized this for giving me a chance to come here and talk. And thank you all for coming. I had no idea how many people would be coming, so it's nice to see so many people. So um, uh, this talk, I'll be looking a little bit back in time at some of the stuff I did some years ago, and I'll be also looking at some of the newer stuff. So some of you might have seen some of it before, but there are definitely some things which are uh, new, which uh, uh, I think nobody but me and the people who did the real work have uh, seen so far. Um, in my talk, I won't be spending too much time on the technology side of things. Um, I'll be mentioning what I'm using and how I do it. Um, but if there's questions to this, then the, um, you're welcome to ask me uh, maybe at the end of the talk, because then we, we can talk about that but I'm going to be focusing more on some of the results which we've been getting with these technologies. Um, but um, here is kind of one of my very old slides, which I've been using a long time. So this is basically um, puts a picture on some of the things which I've really been trying to do with this bioimaging. Because uh, as Susanna said, I did a, a PhD in biophysics. This was kind of true, because in reality, I also did a, bio, uh, a PhD in in nanotechnology and biophysics, so I can kind of choose which one I take. And in reality, it was most nanotechnology, but kind of on the side, I had a little hobby of building microscopes. And, and this was, at this time, Louis Bagatoli said, hey, can you make this microscope for me? And I said, sure. And then I, this kind of caught on, and I kept doing this for years. But I, I really made a big shift going from uh, kind of a more physics and surface uh, science orientated uh, research um, to going and looking at um, more Bio biologically re related um, uh, samples. Um, but the whole basis of this was this, uh, this microscopy where we're, I was trying to make some techniques and use some techniques which could give us more information than you could just get out of a simple image. So um, I spent a lot of time developing techniques to, for example, measure diffusion both in, in cells and tissues. Um, so one could uh, both see um, uh, single molecules but also ensemblers of mo molecules diffusing um, through and in tissues. Um, we can also go in and use these techniques to actually measure, um, vis visualize the pH in different samples. So if you have a piece of muscle, we can go in and we can measure the pH um, and, and see the changes in this muscle if we, if we do things to it. Um, we also have techniques where we can go in and visualize different chemical compositions. And again, we can do this in live samples. So um, this, this uh, I, I like this picture, but and uh, I did this together with Nils. Um, this, uh, this uh, was the first time we actually really used this microscope. And it took us about two minutes uh, to take this nice uh, three-dimensional image of a C. elegans where we can nicely see the lipid droplets here uh, in, in red. So we can really pick out the lipid droplets in the C. elegans with this technique. And again, we, we basically just put the sample on and got this uh, three-dimensional uh, um, uh, image of where the lipid droplets are in a C. elegans. So, um, so some of these techniques um, uh, are are very easy and elegant to use. Um, we have also worked a lot on looking at kind of uh, different types of hydration, iron concentrations, and lipid, lipid packing, and also on um, uh, being able to study the molecular orientation of molecules in, for example, membranes. Um, and there. Um, so the, the basis for these techniques um, are, are, are mainly these, um, uh, lots of them are built in this multi-photon microscopy where um, 
uh, we uh, are, are uh, at least in Denmark, we have uh, some of the best equipment to do this. And I'd say we're, we're pretty leading in that field um, compared to other um, bioimaging centers. Um, and, and this we've coupled together with these fluores uh, fluorescence correlation techniques, which can be used to study the diffusion of molecules um, in your samples. Um, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about this FLIM, which is fluorescence lifetime imaging. Normally, we image the uh, intensity of our sample. So we have maybe a fluorophore, which is emitting light, and we collect this intensity. But another way of, uh, of, of collecting information from our sample is to look at the lifetime, the time that fluorophore actually is excited in. So you send in a pulse of light, and the fluorophore is excited for a while, and then it changes its light, and, and, and then it emits a photon after some time. And we can measure this, uh, uh, this lifetime which is on the order of picoseconds to nanoseconds. And what's interesting about this is that a lot of the fluorescent lifetimes, they're dependent on their environment. So we can, for example, use this as a way to measure pH, because as the pH changes, the fluorophore will change its lifetime. And this is a way uh, we, could use, uh, we can use to do this kind of thing. Um, then also, uh, we, we have this super res resolution optical microscopy. And just very shortly, what's that about? So um, for... Uh, 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 at least a hundred years or more, then uh, one could basically make the best, in principle, make as good optics as you wanted to or had money to make. Um, but one was still limited by the diffraction limit so that what one could image was things down to maybe 200 nanometers in your biological samples with optical microscopy. <coughs> and this was a problem because uh, what's nice about optical microscopy is you can actually look at live things. If, on the other hand, you want to have the high resolution, you have to go, you'd have to go to an electron microscope of some type and here you definitely can't be looking at live samples anymore. So it would be really nice to be able to look at what happens in a, for example, in a cell on a nanoscopic scale um, in a live sample. And this really wasn't possible in any way. But uh, thanks to some new types of microscopy which came about uh, over the last 10, 15 years, um, this, is, uh, this has become possible. And we have one of these techniques called STED here, um, where we actually have the only two STED microscopes in Denmark. And using this, we can get down to a, a resolution of about 30 nanometers in, in cells. And this allows us actually to s uh, begin to see individual proteins in our samples and see what they're doing, instead of looking at a whole soup of proteins at one go. Um, then, uh, thanks to uh, uh, some external grants from, from, uh, from, from Bilum, uh, which was supporting the Bilum Center here at BNB, uh, and then we also, uh, which also bought one of these SED microscopes. Then we also got a hold of one of these uh, CARS microscopes, which is basically a microscope which allows us uh, to uh, visualize specific chemical bonds in our samples. So this means that we can, as in the case of the C. elegans, we can pick out, um, the, uh, for example, the lipids or water or another chemical which we add to our sample and visualize this without having to add any label to it. Um, so uh, so th th what's nice about this is we have a chemical-specific label-free technique. So, I'm going to be showing examples of these different types of microscopy um, through my talk. But again, uh, if you have any questions to them, then feel free to ask at the end. Um, yeah. So this is just uh, uh, one of the examples of, of multi-photo microscopy, where we're actually looking at the, 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 sk the, the skin um, of, a, of, a, uh, of a mouse. Um, so again, I was saying that I was making lots of different microscopes. So over the years, we've got better and better at it. Um, so we've, we've, we, we built uh, lots of these uh, uh, multi-photon microscopes and also a mul uh, we have one of the world's only um, multi-photon uh, STED microscopes. Uh, the advantage of building your own microscope is you can really build it exactly how you want it and it will cost a, a fraction of the price of buying one yourself. The disadvantage of it, it takes a lot of time and it takes quite a bit of energy to keep them running nicely. But uh, what one actually finds is that when you start buying really uh, top-end microscopes, which are really pressing what technology can do from a company, these also need a lot of love and care to actually work properly. So, so one thinks that maybe giving five, six million kroner for a piece of instrument that you'll get something that really works nicely, but not necessarily. This can also need lots of, just as much time as actually uh, a home-built system. So, enough about um, techniques. Um, so, today I'm going to be showing some different examples from my research. So, I'm going to be starting basically showing some uh, results fr from my, my studies of skin and transdermal drug delivery. Then I'm going to be talking about a skin uh, an ear disease called <coughs> acquired polystotoma, which is a, a disease of the inner ear, which I've been re working on for some years. And then also I'm going to be uh, finishing off looking at uh, 
some of our results using <coughs> CARS to diagnose uh, cancer, and also uh, finally uh, a little look at some of the work we're doing on spider silk. So, um, if we look at skin, so uh, uh, the, the skin, it, this is our kind of our major barrier to the outside world. It's, it's got to uh, keep things out, uh, which aren't supposed to get in. It has to be mechanically stable, so that well, if you press it, or uh, um, that, that it won't go to pieces. Um, it, it has to uh, keep harmful things out, but on the other hand, there's lots of things which you want to actually get out through the skin. Um, uh, and um, uh, so, so the, the skin is, is really a, a really important organ in our body. And uh, one thing which is quite obvious about the skin is that for microscopy, it's a pretty good thing to use because it's kind of on the surface and it's pretty easy to access. Um, so, so, uh, so um, um, in strange ways, I started working with skin again uh, as, a, as a, I came from physics and never realized that I at some point would be taking, getting big samples of skin from the hospital and cleaning them and, and using them. But th this is a, this is a, uh, this has become a, a, a part of my work, and I've worked a lot on trying to see how different types of molecules can uh, move through the skin, which. Um, Basically, if we have a quick look at it, we have the stratum corneum, which is built up of these flat, dead um, uh, corneocytes, um, which is um, mainly the, uh, the main outer barrier of the skin. And, uh, the, uh, and this outer barrier, we have the, the corneocytes here, which have a lot of keratin inside them, and around them you have uh, intracellular lipids, which are these stacks of lipids, um, which can be up to maybe 100 nanometers thick. Um, and this is simply what is functioning as our, our, our uh, outermost barrier. Um, and one thing which would be really interesting is, uh, is uh, what type of poisonous things could get through the skin, how do things move through the skin. That could be one way of looking at this. Another way of looking at it could be, okay, I have some drug which I'd like to, to get, to this, uh, get uh, through the skin, um, either deliver um, uh, uh, into the skin or give, it, or, uh, give a systematic drug. And um, some drugs, like for example insulin, one can uh, eat because it will be digested because it's a protein, so you have to inject it. And, and some work has been given on if you could uh, avoid injections and, for example, uh, transport it through the skin. Uh, but what we're going to find out today is that the skin is actually an incredibly good barrier. It really works very well for lots and lots of things. So, so it, it's, it's actually uh, quite difficult to overcome. Um, uh, and, and, and we're going to be looking at uh, also the finer uh, uh, details of how, th how different types of molecules actually can move through the stratum corneum. So, um, one of the pieces of work uh, which I was doing was uh, using this super resolution technique called stimulated emission depletion on skin to be able to visualize um, the skin. And now, using any advanced technique, um, is normally more complicated than using the, the normal technique you just have. So the normal technique for this could be, for example, just simple confocal microscopy. And it is much easier to do confocal microscopy. The demands to your samples are much less. So if you have a sample where you can answer your scientific question with a simple technique, an easy technique, and maybe cheap technique, you should use this. Instead of going and saying, okay, I've just got this nice new machine, which was really expensive. I'm going to just throw whatever sample I have on it and, and, and and, and see if I can't uh, uh, just see something with it, which I probably could have seen anyway. But there are actually some re good reasons to use super resolution on skin. And that is again because these li lipids here, um, they're, they're typical, uh, uh, the, the lipid bilayers, their typical uh, thickness is on the order of uh, maybe 100 nanometers, which we can't actually resolve in our normal confocal microscope. And this would mean we wouldn't actually be able to see if uh, we wouldn't be able to see this, and, and we wouldn't be able to see if something was beside this or in this with our, t with our normal microscope. So here we have an example. Th these are the, some dead corneocytes on the top of some skin here. Um, and, uh, and here we've zoomed in on this little bit here. And this is a, a height pro intensity profile over, over, over these um, lipids here, which are labeled with a lipid dye. And this is the, uh, the, the same in image in confocal. Um, where we really can see that uh, the, the stead image is really picking out much finer details, so we see, we, we see all these, the, we, we're resolving the structure here, while in the case of confocal, we're, we're, we're really not. So, um, to look at these structures, we actually need uh, a, a super resolution microscope to be able to really see what's going on. Um, yeah, this is just a little bit more of the same. 
So, so again, we, we can really go in. This is a slice of the skin instead of looking at it from above, where each of these uh, lines here, this, this is the, um, uh, the intracellular lipids. And what we actually can do here is instead of just imaging them, because we can see them here, we can actually start to resolve them. Um, <coughs> and again, an intensity profile. So one of the things we've been using this for is to study the structure of skin. And one of the, th so the, the skin is not just lipids and keratin. We also have different proteins which are holding the skin together. And one of these is the corneal desmosomes. So the corneal desmosomes, they form a plaque um, uh, between two uh, adjacent cells, um, where, where, where this, the, the plaque is then connecting to the keratin inside the cell on each side. And in between here, you have the intracellular lipids. And Typically, to image this kind of thing, you would be using a transmission electron microscopy. And the types of images which you'd find in literature would be this, where they're pointing here and saying, this is what a corneal desmosome looks like, or um, this, is, uh, this is what a corneal desmosome looks like. So th this is, um, I mean, if you look at these types of images, uh, for, I mean, you kind of have to, um, you don't get a lot of information out of this. You can see where they are, but you, you don't really uh, get a lot of information out of it. Using the SED microscope and um, immunolabeled uh, desmoplakine um, in human skin, we could actually go in and, and resolve these same types of images. So this is, this is the plaque um, on each side, and here in the middle one has the intracellular lipids. So we actually really can start to resolve this in, um, in rather intact tissue. Um, but but th this is, here we, we, we can see this, and this is a nice image, but, it might be, uh, but we haven't really learned that much more. So, what we see is we kind of see this train track-like structure here along the edges of the, of the adjacent cells. If we, uh, and we can actually resolve them quite nicely here. But what happens is if we actually zoom in and try to make a three-dimensional reconstruction of what we're seeing here, is we see that there's not just two lines next to each other. We see that these plaques, they form these round-like structures creating a network all the way across and around, um, around the, um, the, uh, the, the adjacent cells. And in actual fact, this makes much more sense because this is a much more stable construction. If one of these breaks, then there's going to be lots of others taking over. And this makes a much barrier and a much more stable barrier. But this one really couldn't get out of these two-dimensional images, which wasn't getting out of the tin. So this is an example where we really can see that using these uh, modern technologies, that we actually start to, um, are able to start to get more information out of our, um, out of our images. Um, so that was a little bit on the structure of skin. So we, we've done a lot of studies looking at lots of different proteins in the skin and, and trying to, um, to see what we can learn from that. Um, but uh, to move on um, uh, to uh, some, I'm going to start talking about trans <coughs> um, uh, drug delivery. And in this case, I'm going to look back at some of some work I did some years back, ago, looking at transdermal um, liposome penetration. So, um, uh, maybe, I, it was a long time ago, I don't know if it was five or six years ago, I think Louis Bagatoli was at a conference on skin, and they were discussing what actually happens with a, a liposome when it passes through skin. Because lots of people, they develop this idea, we can make a liposome, we can put something inside it, and somehow this liposome will carry things through the skin barrier and deliver the drug inside the skin. And there was quite a lot of work in literature on this, and you could find your favorite lipid composition, it could be you could call them flexosomes, putting some surfactants in or doing something, and, uh, and, and, and see how they were delivering drugs. But the question was, do they really um, work as a kind of vehicle where they actually carry the drug through, or do they just all break on the surface and move through? And maybe if the liposomes have an enhancing effect, it's an effect as a chemical enhancer and not as a mechanical enhancer um, carrying things through. And so Lewis, he told me that he was uh, wa walking along with these people and they were discussing this, and it, it was in, in the winter in the States. And the guy, he took a snowball and says, here, I'll show you exactly what I think happens with the liposomes. And he took the snowball and chucked at a wall, and it splattered out. And he said, this, this is what I think. And so Lewis came back and said, I, I kind of want you to answer this question for me. What really happens with this? And so I spent uh, uh, some of my time as a postdoc trying to find out whether or not these liposomes, they could move through like this, and, or, or if they just break on the surface. And one could say, okay, this is easy, let's just uh, take a picture. But the problem is, is that these liposomes are maybe on the order of 100 nanometers. Um, and we can't resolve these in our normal microscopes. It, we, 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 we wouldn't be able to see the difference between these two situations if we have a liposome with something in it, or if we have a liposome with something beside it. We wouldn't be able to do that. So I had to find a different technique to be able to do this. 
And uh, to do this, I decided to look at, uh, at how things move. Um, so this is an image of some, uh, uh, I think my videos probably don't want to play. This is an image, this image here is um, of a bead diffusing in water taken with a confocal microscope. Now, confocal microscopes, they scan their images backwards and forwards, taking one pixel at a time. So you start up here, and the laser moves backwards and forwards like this, picking up the intensity in each pixel. And what we actually see here is we can see that the, um, are, in this case, some quantum dots, they're diffusing, and they're making a path here, which, which we pick up at some point, and then we lose it again because um, they've diffused away. And um, if you look at a diffusion like this, and you, you consider... I know my laser. I know how fast I'm moving a laser. I know how far I'm moving a laser. So that means I know when I was here, and I know what the distance is here. I actually have some information about time and velocity just in my image, because I know how fast I'm scanning, and I know uh, how, how far I've moved. So in actual fact, in this image, there's information on how fast this particle is moving. And uh, so uh, this technique, there's a technique to get this information out called Raster Image Correlation Spectroscopy, or RICS. Um, which was de uh, developed by Enrico Cotong and his group in uh, the LFD in California. Um, so I, uh, uh, I went there and learned how to do this. Um, and um, uh, and uh, here's an example. This is what the measurement could look like. It looks a little bit boring. So, so uh, what you do is you basically uh, uh, just correlate uh, the intensity one pixel and see, okay, how is the intensity in the next pixel and the next pixel? And, and you analyze this, and you, you get a graph out looking like this. So this is an example of a, uh, of a road mean PE, which is a, a, a labeled uh, lipid analog, which I could add to the skin, and I could measure the diffusion and see, uh, and see how that went. Um, so so um, this would be what the measurement looked like, and then I'd fit it to um, a, a model and get a diffusion out, which in this case was on the order of about 0 0.83 uh, micrometers squared per second. And I also did this for different types of dyes. So I did this for, 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 uh, for the dyes I was planning on using. Um, and what you actually could get out of this is quite interesting because, um, because we're analyzing a whole image, you can actually make a map of the diffusion on the skin. And what you actually can see is that this is the corner of a corneocyte here, and th these are the edges here. And this heat map is showing that most of the diffusion is actually happening in this area here. Um, so uh, so the, the, the diffusion is not... Um, homogeneous through the skin, but it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's inhomogeneous. This is, in, this is not surprising if you think about uh, or, uh, something like the skin, but I believe this was the first time one actually really could show this at this, at this level. Um, so, but how am I going to use this to understand how liposomes they diffuse through the skin and, and what they do? So my idea was to make um, uh, doubly labeled liposomes, liposomes with some, something inside. This could be a dextrin with a label on it. And, and label the membrane as well. And um, if we imagine what happens, if, if they're moving together, then basically what I'll see is um, that that's the case over here. So I imagine that my, my dextrin, uh, my doubly labeled liposome here, is, has a maybe I've made a red and a blue example here. They're moving together. Uh, uh, th then uh, the intensity of, if I record a red and a, uh, a blue channel, the intensity of the red and the blue they will go up and down at the same time as one of my particles moves in and out. Okay? On the other hand, if my liposomes are, are broken and I have my green and my blue fluor or red, sorry, and blue fluorophore moving um, uh, uh, freely by themselves, then, then there'll be no correlation between the time when one comes by and when another comes by. So my basic <coughs> idea is to see if there's a correlation in the diffusion. If there's a correlation, then the things are moving together. If there's no correlation, then they're broken. Um, so I went to do this. I made my doubly labeled uh, liposomes, uh, my, my LUFs, and, uh, and then I, I did, did my measurement. This is the, the measurement of the one channel. And basically looking at these graphs, a big nice peak here shows that you have a big, uh, that there's something happening. Okay? That the amplitude of this actually is inversely proportional with the number I have. So if it falls, I'm actually getting more free particles. That's, but uh, what I can see is I can get a nice signal from my, my rhodomy B, which is in my membrane a nice, in this case, a signal from my ATO 647N label stereotype. <coughs> and when I do the cross-correlation, I get a really nice big cross-correlation. So they're really moving together nicely. Now let's see what happens if I add these liposomes to the skin. So on the surface of the skin, I can still get my signal from my free streptavidin and from my rhodomene PE. 
and I can get a little uh, cross correlation uh, from my from my uh, from on the surface. If I move uh, just a little bit below the surface um, here, just four to six micrometers below the surface, I get again I can recover my streptavidin, I can recover my rhodamine, uh, but I see absolutely no cross correlation. So really nothing. <coughs> so so um, and. Uh, this is kind of summary, and, and I did this with different types of vesicles, some loops and some uh, flexible liposomes, and this was exactly the same story. As soon as I got um, just a little bit below the, the stratum corneum, into the stratum corneum, no cross-correlation, so no liposomes moving together. But I could recover the diffusion of the free dyes moving in there, which I'd measured by themselves. So, this was really telling me, okay, that, um, uh, that, that the they lose their content on the way in. They, they, they break. So I was presenting this to different places, and then people said, well, okay, maybe they lose their contents, but maybe the liposome goes in, and, and there's still a liposome there, but it's just lost its content. So um, I said, okay, well, we'll have a look at this as well. Um, so, and, and, it, and I decided to use a, a stead for this as well. So again, here we have our little liposomes, and what we can do is we can really start resolving them, so we're getting down to resolving them at this around 100 nanometers. Well, here, this is the same sample just uh, seen in confocal, where we see um, that, uh, uh, that, that we're, we're not at all resolving them, but we're, we're seeing them, but not resolving them. So um, this is, this is a, a cut through the skin. So what I've done is I've taken some skin, I've labeled it with liposomes, I've cryofrozen it, and I've cut it. And what we can see in the case of these lobs, which are made of POVC, so they're quite, they're, they're quite rigid. Um, we can see on the surface the individual liposomes sitting there, um, not going anywhere. Um, in the case of these flexible liposomes, we can actually see that our, our, our dye has actually moved uh, relatively far into the sample. So just to make sure that th this is um, out here, we have kind of outside the skin, and this would be inside the skin here, okay? So, so uh, the, this is the stratum corneum out here, and we have the dermis down here. Um, here we can actually see that our dye has moved in to, to the stratum corneum, um, but we don't see any individual liposomes. So in this case, with the flexible liposomes, what we believe is happening is that they're, they're simply breaking on the surface, but because they have a surfactant in them, they work as a penetration enhancer. And they, help, can, they can help the drug in by not actually by, um, uh, by having them uh, as a mechanical helper, but actually as a chemical um, uh, penetration enhancer. So, and yeah, just more pictures, so just looking from above, where again, we can see as we move down <coughs> to the sample, we really stop, stop seeing uh, any um, individual liposomes. So, um, what we could see through this study is that liposomes, they really do not survive contact intactly through the stratum corneum. Um, we could see also that the diffusion uh, of the vesicles, uh, uh, the diffusion of the uh, labeled vesicles in the skin was very close to the diffusion of the free dyes, which makes me think that the dyes have broken up and we're just looking at that. Um, but, the, but we do have an, an effect of some of these things where we think that they actually can work as chemical uh, penetration enhancers. So that was on, on, on this, this, this one scale. Um, on the, um, on, but what we also would actually like to do is be able to really see how different types of molecules they can pass through um, the stratum corneum. So if we imagine that we had a hydrophilic molecule, would it kind of go through this way? Or would it actually uh, diffuse along these lipid bilayers somehow and through them to get through? Which way does it actually have to go through? If we have a lipophilic molecule, then we kind of expect it to go to the, to the lipids and be there. But what actually happens to a, a hydrophilic molecule? So um, we designed an experiment where we, were look, where, where we had a, a hydrophilic molecule and a, a amphiphilic in this case, which would, be, uh, which would bind in the lipids. And we wanted to see um, uh, how, uh, how, the, how these would, where they would go in the skin and, uh, and, and how they would diffuse through. Now, in this case here, we're looking at, at, at distances which are maybe, um, so, so this, this bilayer here is maybe on the order of 14 nanometers, the repeat distance. And this actually becomes quite difficult. This I cannot resolve in my state microscope, so I have to use a different type of technique. So I, my idea was I would like to find a way where I could measure the distance between my two dyes. So my, my, my red dye, which I have out here in the, uh, uh, maybe out here uh, by the hit group, so this is a, 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 my 
hydrophilic dye and a dye which is labeling the membranes. Um, to use this, I use this technique called phosphorescent energy transfer, or some call it fluorescence resident energy transfer, which is a, something a lot of people do, but it's a misgiving name because there's no transmission via fluorescence. Um, what's interesting about this technique is that um, uh, it, uh, we, get, we have a donor molecule which can give its energy, uh, excitation energy, to an acceptor molecule um, via a dipole-dipole uh, coupling. Um, and what we can use this for is that this effect here, the efficiency of this coupling between these two, is incredibly sensitive to the distance. So the dis the, uh, so, so this fret efficiency goes with uh, 1 over uh, r to the 6. So this means where r is the distance between these molecules. So this means I have to move my molecule a tiny bit, and I get quite a big effect on my uh, fret efficiency. And this means that one can actually use this as a kind of a spectroscopic ruler to measure distances in samples on the order of, of a few nanometer. So, so this is a kind of spectroscopic ruler which we can use for this. So again, I, I, I was, uh, I, I'm going to show one example of one fret pair, but we use different fret pairs, where we have a donor here, a, a, a green fluorophore here, um, which uh, is an amphiphilic, so it will go to the membrane. And we have a rhodamine beak, which we're not quite sure where it's going to be going. Um, but this, this is relatively hydrophobic. Um, and again, uh, to be able to, um, to do this fret, then we have to have a nice overlap of, uh, of the uh, emission spectrum of our donor and the uh, uh, excitation spectrum of our um, acceptor. And the way we do these, these measurements is that we use uh, FLIM, so our lifetime imaging of this. And this is an example, and, and here we're not imaging the intensity in this image. This is actually an image of the lifetimes. Um, and uh, in this image here, I can see this has moved a bit, but in this image here, so um, the, the redder colors are in all the, uh, are correspond to about uh, 1.8 nanoseconds, and the blue color corresponds to about 3.4 nanoseconds. And what we can see is that when we have the donor only, then we have a rather long lifetime, and when we add the acceptor, then our lifetime changes and becomes much, uh, much shorter. Um, and we can use this to analyze the distance between our, uh, our fluorophores. Um, and so what we do is we do, a, a, do some experiments where we have different concentrations of donor. Um, and uh, what we, we can then take all our images and actually analyze them in a very nice way uh, using this uh, phase representation. All we have to get out of this is that um, going this way is basically an, an increasing of the of fret efficiency. And what we're doing is we're just adding more and more of our acceptor um, to our sample and seeing that we're getting a higher and higher fret. Um, and if, if we look at the results which we got from this, um, then we can see that what happens is, is that as, as this is our acceptor concentration going up here, we ha uh, I'm showing two different experiments here, one for, for two different acceptors for ATO 647N and Rodin B. Um, and what we can see is that at some, at some acceptor concentration, uh, the, uh, the, the fret efficiency flattens off. Um, and if we translate this fret efficiency to distance, then what we can see is that, at so, again, at, this, at some concentration, um, the distance which our molecules can approach each other um, uh, the, uh, doesn't get uh, any smaller. So there's a kind of a, there's a hindrance. Um, and this, this, is, this, this is quite logical because one of the molecules is inside the membrane and one of them uh, we believe to be outside around the head groups. Um, so what can we actually learn from this experiment? So the first very interesting thing is that, th that we really do have the, the um, hydrophilic fluorophore moving around the head groups, or moving through the head groups of the, these, these samples. We've done experiments like this with lipid membranes as well to test that the distances and things also make sense. But, but what we can learn from this is that um, our, our, our hydrophilic dye is actually really in this part of the membrane and moving through here, and not just, for example, out here. Um, what we also can see is because we have this fret distance of between 5 and 4.5 nanometers, um, that, uh, that we have a repeat distance here, which must be larger than this. So, and this is a little bit interesting because Sachs measurements of these have also suggested that there could be a short repeat distance in skin, which one's only seen in, in rats but not in humans, um, of, a, of about um, 6 nanometers. And so use, using this measurement, we never saw anything which was showing this repeat distance of around 6. And if it was there, we would have seen it really clearly because 
again, the fret efficiency goes with the six power. And if I could have gotten uh, two or three nanometers closer, it would have made a really big difference. So with this, we can really show that, uh, that the, the fusion um, really takes this route and doesn't take the direct route through here. And again, um, this might seem a trivial view, but this has been something which people have been looking at for years. And I think this is the first time where we've really shown that this is the way it is on this size scale. So, um, transdermal drug delivery, what now? Um, so, we've seen that uh, my, my liposomes, so I'd, I'd like the liposomes to work, right? That would have been a much better story, right? That I've invented a way to do transdermal drug delivery where I could just get everything through, put it exactly where I wanted to. This was the story you wanted, right? So, I mean, the, the fact that it didn't work, this is kind of a downer, but that, you know, that's the way it goes. So, my um, uh, grandfather, his, one of his mottos was, if it doesn't work, get the bigger hammer. Um, so, so um, th this is basically what we're trying to do here. So, what, one of the ongoing projects we have at the moment is that we're using these derma rollers, which are these little rollers with small needles on, which can uh, make small, um, uh, small holes in, in the skin. Um, and uh, this, is, this, is, this is one of the images from one of my master's students working on this at the moment, where the, uh, the green color here, if you would come close enough, they're actually nanoparticles. You can see individual nanoparticles going in here. The, the blue color is, is actually a, a dextrin, um, so it, it's a, a, which we're using as a model uh, sample, which is also really diffusing in. And, um, and the red is basically just the tissue. And what we can see is here that, again, where we don't have any hole, we really don't have any penetration. So again, the stratum corneum is really a good barrier. But if we uh, use the derma roller, which um, we say doesn't hurt very much. <laughs> um, we're also, um, uh, together with um, a Peace Bria Hospital, we're using laser ablation. So you basically take a laser and you burn a, uh, s uh, some holes in the skin. And uh, the, the stratum corneum would be out here, and we'd have these holes here. And then you can add your drug and get your, your, your uh, drug going through there. And what we're kind of interested in is that with the, the laser ablation, you're actually damaging the tissue here. So the green stuff here is collagen. And we can see that the collagen really doesn't go out to the end of the hole here. So here you're really burning a hole in the tissue. It, a, you're just removing tissue, but you're damaging it. So if we're adding our drug through here, we might, our drug actually might have difficulty getting through this new layer of, of burnt tissue. Um, and we're comparing this to the effect of this derma roller, um, where this hole will close up pretty fast. Well, this one you'll have for a while, which means we can maybe get more drug in it, but it means you might also get a bigger chance of getting infected and things like that. So, um, and also, um, so the skin I've been getting has been from the hospital, and we've been happy to be able to get skin from the hospital, but um, uh, one of our, newer, our, our, our newly started projects is actually working on culturing artificial skin, which I'm doing with um, Judith Fincher at FOF. Um, where, uh, in this case, this is, uh, uh, again, one of my master's students um, who uh, is, has cultivated um, some artificial skin here. Um, it takes about 21 days. We have a rather thick stratum corneum up here. We have the, the living cells down here. This is just autofluorescence. And again, because of the uh, experience we have in characterizing normal skin and the diffusion through normal skin, we're doing this on, on these artificial skins which are culturing. Um, and ag again, here, we're, we've just labeled for some desmoplaquine to again begin to see if we're getting the same type of structures this, uh, as we're getting in normal skin. Um, so this is something which we're going to be spending uh, a lot, quite a lot of energy on the, in the coming future. Also, developing basically a 3D printer which can print tissue. <coughs> so we're starting with skin because the skin is easy, it's two-dimensional and it's, it's easier to print up. But in the long run, it might be nice to be able to print more complicated things as well. So, um, colostoma. This is an, uh, we're going to check, so it's, it's still basically all about skin. So on the inner ear of, of uh, in our inner ear, we have, uh, 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 um, we, we can, uh, one, one can have that uh, uh, a skin growth actually starts growing inside here. Um, and this is what we call acquired colostoma. And the toma bit could sound something like a tumor, but it's not, a, it, it's not a tumor. It's, um, uh, it, it's a, but, but it, but it, it's, it keeps growing. And what it can do, unfortunately, is it, when it grows to a certain size, of course it gets painful that you have this, uh, this uh, thing growing in your inner ear, but it can start to gnaw through the bone, and then it actually can go through the bone and reach the brain, and then you die. And again, in, in, uh, in Denmark, I think it's about one out of, 
I think it's about one out for every 60,000 people who get it. So it's not that, uh, it's not that big a, uh, uh, an issue. Um, the way to deal with it is you have to operate. So typically, uh, you can either go through the ear or they drill a hole um, through the back of the, behind the ear and go in and, uh, and operate it out. And in Denmark, this, this, you can do this quite easily at the hospital. But of course, in, in, in third world countries, this is a serious thing you die of. And one really doesn't know why this, why this happens. And typically, you can also have reoccurrences of it. So when I started working on this, um, they basically were just saying that, there, uh, that this cholecystoma it was this, a, a carotene mass that made of, uh, this is just some different texts I found uh, in different places. Uh, it said it may contain some cholesterol crystals, has nothing to do with cholesterol. It's basically just uh, accumulated keratin dibris. That, that's what they were, they were talking about. And I was wondering, okay, what, and the, but the people who were operating on this, they could see lipids in there. They could see things happening. And they wanted to know some more about this. So the, the first thing we did is we took some images of uh, cholestatoma li uh, labeled with a, a lipophilic dye. And in this, uh, in this side here, we see some uh, cells which are from normal skin. So we're going deeper and deeper into the skin. Here we have the viable cells here. Here have these, we have the cells on the surface. And what we could see is that this, the, the cholestatoma, it looked quite a lot like normal skin. The only difference was is that it went on forever. So, I mean, you could go 70 uh, micrometers, you could go hundreds of micrometers into this, and you still just had this kind of strange stratum corneum-like tissue. And so we thought, okay, well, this kind of looks a bit like skin. Let's see, uh, uh, look at it some more. And again, we compared this just with autofluorescence. And again, uh, we, here, comparing to the normal skin, we have structures like the stratum corneum going very deep into the tissue and this, uh, uh, this is basically seen from the stratum corneum side or the stratum brassale side. So we could take the tissue and flip it. And, and this is basically what it was looking like. Um, we got more, uh, we got our cast microscope. So we also tried shooting that on this. So the green here is collagen. This is the lipids. And again, over here, we have normal skin. And you can find some areas in the cholestatoma where, uh, where, where things are growing. But notice that the scale bars are the same here. And, and that the, 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 colors, the stratum corneum here is really, really thick. Compare, and, and we also find these areas here in the cholestatoma where we just have this endless layers of stratum corneum, basically. Um, so we went, to, uh, so we kind of, we knew there were lipids there. So we wanted to go, we wanted to go and show that there were lipids there. So we just did some high performance thin layer chromatography. And we could show that there was lots of lipids and cholesterol <coughs> and that they were comparable to what was found in, in uh, human control skin. Um, so again, uh, four and five of the, uh, the cholestatoma, and five or six um, as the human controls. So we can see uh, that a lot of the lipids, which, uh, basically the lipids which are um, in the human, in, in the stratum corneum, are also in the cholestatoma. Um, we did this again, um, just looking at the, uh, the cholestatoma, the cholestatoma sulfate, and the cholestatoma ester. And again, here, here we found that there were very comparable um, uh, levels of, of cholesterol. And again, we looked at it in, in different ways, looking at it as uh, total amount, uh, total grams of lipids per dry tissue, but also as, uh, as, a, as amount compared to um, the, the lipids. And, and um, th there really wasn't a very big uh, uh, difference. The only real difference we uh, might have found was that maybe the cholesterol ester was a little bit smaller, but very similar to normal skin. Um, we also decided to go look at the packing of skin. We could do this using this Lorden generalized polarization. We have a dye which is sensitive to how the lipids pack. It basically changes color um, as, as the, um, if the lipids pack differently. Um, and we did this with, again, with cholestatoma and normal skin. And we saw that they also, the lipids not only, we have basically lip, lipids there. We have the same structures. The lipids are packing the same way. I guess we're getting close to lipids. Uh, skin. We also went and looked at the uh, uh, different proteins in the skin. Um, so in this case, it's a cytokeratin. Um, and, uh, uh, if, and, and if we zoom in, we can see again that the structures are very similar um, in the stratum corneum to that of the uh, cytokeratin. I ex uh, excuse me, because the zoom on this, these images are a little bit different. The scale bar is the same, but the scale bar here is a little bit smaller. So the images are really quite comparable. Um, some proteins were different. Um, so in the case of desmoplakine, then we have these uh, individual spots here <coughs> which we find in the skin, which, which, uh, which I showed you, showed you earlier. 
but in the uh, in the closed thermal we have kind of a no individual spots and things are much more spread out and we spent a lot of time really making controls to show that this wasn't a mistake so, so this is really the case so we wonder if if, if the decimal plaquen in this case uh, the plaques are just going to pieces and not forming plaques in here um, we don't know that yet but something we're working on but being at BNB and looking at these proteins um, got me interested in that so I got uh, help from Frank Kelsen um, who uh, was happy to come and help me um, uh, do some proteomics on this and um, what we were looking at, we were looking at ear skin stratum corneum, cholestatoma, and ear skin uh, epidermis, and the, the stratum corneum. And what was quite nice for us to see is that when, when, when we uh, uh, sorted our, uh, our data, that we could really actually pick out our different, um, uh, our different uh, species. Uh, what we also could see um, is that, uh, interestingly, that uh, the cholestatoma, uh, it, uh, the regulated proteins, that it most fitted together with them from the, those from the stratum corneum. And um, what, what we also can see is that the, the regulated proteins, they correspond to skin diseases, which you, for example, could find in uh, psoriasis as well. So, which is pointing towards that this cholestatoma could uh, be due to um, uh, 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 something more along the lines of psoriasis. So, uh, basically, uh, we've really shown, when we started with this, the idea was this, this cholestatoma just was keratin, gibberish. But we've really shown that it has a similar structure to the stratum corneum. It has lipids, um, and, and the lipids pack in the same way. It's really not just this uh, keratin debris. Um, and it will have some kind of bar barrier function, and it, uh, uh, and it's, um, and, um, and it has a similar amount of cholesterol. Um, and uh, the protein regulation uh, suggests that the cholestatoma could be related to some skin diseases. So. Um, the last two things, I'm not going to take too long. I'm going to, we've been working cars on skin. We can use this technique to look at the lipids, which are in red here, and the water, which are blue here. Um, and we've been using this um, um, to uh, image um, uh, as a tool to look for um, uh, cancer in head and neck cancer. Head and neck cancer is a good thing to use for optically because we can go in and look at it um, uh, Without, having, without being too invasive. Um, what, what I found a, a while back was that in this image we have basically healthy um, tissue. And here we see this, this, the cells uh, on, on the surface of the epithelium. Um, and, and as we move down, uh, we meet the, uh, what we call the basement membrane. And just below that, we see the collagen, which is, uh, which is forming um, below the basement membrane. In the case of, uh, of carcinoma, uh, then the, the, we can really see the collagen, which is breaking up towards the surface. We see that the lipids are really organized in a very different way than in the case of, of, uh, of, the, um, of the healthy skin. And also, if we, look at, if we analyze it a little bit deeper, the structure and organization of the, lipid, uh, of the cells is also very different. So, um, uh, one of the things which we've been working on now is it's getting a lot of different samples from the hospital. And uh, imaging these and comparing these to normal um, uh, pathology results. And so in this case, we have healthy skin. We can nicely see the basement membrane over here. And in our CARS images, and lipid, we, we can really begin to see the same structures. And uh, um, uh, on the other hand, if we have a case of invasive carcinoma, um, we can really start to see. Uh, we, we can also see the similar structures that we can see in, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in, in the normal pathology images. And the idea is now that we're building up a database of these images, um, which we're going to be use, uh, teaching um, a machine to be able to analyze. And the long-term goal is that we can actually go and um, yeah, so we have uh, that we can go and actually look at the patient without taking a biopsy and do an optical biopsy on the patient without without cutting the patient, and that uh, these will be analyzed uh, by a computer while the while the doctor is looking at you, so they can really find out exactly where the tumor is and decide immediately what the best type uh, of treatment is. Making these samples over here typically could take up to four days where they first take the sample, freeze it, uh, fix it, um, slice it, label it, and look at it. Being able to get uh, an online uh, diagnosis will mean that you'll be able to remove less so, and, and remove it faster. So, so this could end up being a great improvement for people. Last little thing. Um, one of the uh, little funny projects which I've been running is looking at spider silk with some of the techniques I have available. 
Um, basically, what we did is uh, uh, we uh, uh, take our spider silk, and, and we've been studying it with the different techniques. It could be confocal microscopy, where we label, for example, the lipids and the proteins. And, uh, and or we could be using this, this cars microscopy to, again, to, for example, pick out the lipids and the proteins. Um, and we've also had help from the people in Sunnabor, uh, where we've gone and looked at using this uh, scanning helium ion microscope. Here we have a, a spider fiber here. And uh, if we zoom in here on this little area here, we can actually see that inside the fiber, there's some microfibrils, which are, which are fibrils which make up the, the, the fiber on a different scale. And while, while this, the fiber itself can easily be um, six micrometers in diameter, these fibrils are down around uh, 28 nanometers. And if we, if we go and zoom in on, on, on what we're learning about this, um, then we can see that the fiber uh, itself is built up of different layers. So on the outside, you have this lipid layer, which is protecting the fiber. Um, and inside you have this core of fibers, which is kind of building up the core, uh, building up the fiber, and uh, um, and uh, and this core here. Um, uh, so so the, the fiber itself is actually quite a complicated structure. Uh, what the overall goal of this project could be is to be able to learn how to make this spider silk um, uh, in a way so that one could actually produce spider silk and use it for products. Um, what we have been working on is using the techniques we have. And one of the things we can see is that these, the spider silk actually emits um, uh, fluorescence when we excite it. And the spiders, they have multiple different types of silk they can make. They have two major types. They can make um, many types of silk, but two major types of silk which they use uh, are, are, are major and minor. And we can see that they have different optical properties for emitting light. So, so, uh, uh, and, and then we also found out that uh, if we pull the fibers um, and what we can do is we can rotate the polarization of the light which we excite the, the, the fiber with. So light is a, is a wave and it can have an orientation. And as we rotate this, then the intensity um, of the signal which we get out of the, the, the fiber um, changes. And this is because the light, if, the, if the, the dipole which we have to excite, which is going to be emitting the light, is aligned with the, the light coming in, then we get a good excitation. If they're misaligned, then we get a bad excitation, uh, a low excitation. And what we found is that this is actually changing when we, when we change the strain on our fiber. So, so the, the, uh, as we increase the strain, the, then uh, the, the ratio of the, of, of the intensity, which is, which is highly polarized, goes up. Um, and we hope that this is a way that we can go in and get a handle on what's happening on the uh, microscopic level uh, or microscopic level and compare this to what's happening on the molecular level. Um, so our idea is that when the when this, uh, spider, when the, it is not taut, we have a situation like this. And when we pull it, the dipoles become orientated. And uh, what we think is that uh, we, we know that uh, the, the spider silk is built up of these beta sheets, which are, are connected by alpha helixes. And one of our models is, is that when we stretch this, we're, we're stretching the, the, uh, the alpha helixes, so they're becoming more aligned. And this is why we're seeing this uh, increase in the... Um, in the, in the polarization. And we're working on this together with Frank Kelsen because this is just a model we'd like to go in and we'd actually like to find the proteins. So uh, th this is kind of the next step which we're doing on this to be able to really understand what's happening there as well. So at long last, I got to the end. Lots of people have contributed to this. Um, uh, my old postdoc, Yes Dreyer, did a, a lot of the stead work. Bjarne's working with the cars on, uh, on the cancer tissue. Irina's working on the spider stuff. Um, Hela is working on has, is working on the stead in, in, in tissue, um, and um, and and um, and uh, and Max is doing who is doing the proteomics on the cholestatoma, and yeah. So thanks to everybody who helped me, and thank you for listening. examples of interdisciplinary uh, science and translational science as well. Questions? So looking at the time, I thought I had maybe one too many examples. <laughs> <coughs> so, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you very much for showing your nice work. I was just wondering, the crastotoma, uh, in some cases, it reaches the brain. So the brain also has the blood brain barrier. So you think it breaks the blood brain barrier or? So, so I'm not sure if it actually breaks the blood brain barrier or if it's just the pressure which is coming on it which, 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 ends, up, which ends up killing you. Okay. 
So, so my, my knowledge goes to the fact that I've been told that it kills people if it gets there. Um, <laughs> I, I, but I don't actually know what it is you end up dying of. Yeah, but, but the only injury is the bedroom barrier. So I also give, and I have some experience with this barrier that it may break something and it reaches the brain because there's no other way. So the barrier yeah. is broken. Yeah, but, but this is a very mechanical attack. I mean, so, so I mean, there's, uh, and there's actually very few, few things which actually can uh, eat through bone uh, the way this does. So, so it's the only epithelial which one knows that actually can push its way and gnaw its way through bone. So, so it's, um, in that way, it, it, it's quite aggressive. Given what you know about the fate of these liposomes on, on the skin surface, do you have any ideas how you could maybe make different types of liposomes that would last any longer, or so is, is that simply given up? So, so in actual fact, what we found out is that combining these derma roller or this yeah. laser ablation together with liposomes right. gives a, a better result than uh, one of them by, yeah. uh, uh, by themselves. But so without such a fine roller. So, so, so with, without, uh, well, there is the chemical enhancement. Yeah. And this is, this is a fact. This is yeah. that it's been proven uh, multiple times that using this helps. But it's important to know how it's helping. Yeah. Because if you think it's transporting it through exactly. as, a, as a vehicle, so, so yeah. you, you can't, but this will also allow us to plan better liposomes to say, okay, exactly. what we're actually doing is doing chemical enhancement. Mm -hmm. yeah. So are you working on that, Judith? So, um, to, uh, Together with Judith, we're, we're using lots of different types of uh, liposomes. Um, we're using also typical things which are available and relatively cheap because if we want to make anything out of it in the end, this will be. Uh, but so we're not developing new things, but we're developing, we're, we're tweaking them. I don't know. Go ahead. Your question is okay. <laughs> so, so what breaks these liposomes on the skin? Like what mechanism? I cannot imagine that it's actually throwing snowballs. Right? Yeah, so, so um, I mean, some of it is just the contact that you, you come in, and, and then there, there will be some Van der Waals interactions between this which could break them. But I also think that one of the things which is happening here is that generally uh, you do this non occlusively so the water is evaporating uh, while the liposomes are here. And, and th in the older models, one suggested that this is what was kind of forcing the liposomes to penetrate into the skin. But... but um, so, so th there's lots of things happening which could drop. <coughs> it's a more general question. So you mentioned, and I completely agree, that if you don't really need the super resolution, then why bother actually applying it? But do you think, anyway, in like, let's say, five, ten years from now, just because the technology is available that publication-wise, that we will all need to do super resolution rather than regular confocal uh, imaging? I'm, I'm sure also, like, obviously, the companies, they have a big interest in, in pushing these uh, technologies. So I think that if you publish something that, and you say you're using advanced technique, it can maybe help you get somewhere. But uh, I don't, in the long run, I don't think it will help you get that far. I mean, I really think that, I mean, so I think that maybe, let's say a SID is new, that you can be the first person to use SID on this, the first person to use SID on that, the first in this field. But after, as you say, after 10, 15 years, this will be uh, uh, normal. And, and then I, I think that people will actually be looking at the results. And this is also what is happening when I go to conferences. So in, in the early days, it was all about the microscopes, and now it's becoming all about the results. Can you explain uh, somehow how the super resolution works? In yes. The uh, so there's multiple techniques to do this. Um, so. so um, some of them are basically that you just have so few, few fluorophores on at one time that you can localize one fluorophore very precisely and, and, and build up your images of thousands of images of single fluorophores. That, that, that's one basic technique. There's another technique which is called structured illumination where you structure the illumination of your light in such a way that you can get an enhancement of about a factor of two. Um, the technique which we have here is this uh, at SU is, is called STED which is, uh, stands for Stimulated Emission Depletion. And the way this basically works is that you use two lasers. One laser which is just exciting your, your dye in a normal way um, and would give you your diffraction limited spot. And then you have a second laser, which we'll call a depletion laser, which is formed as a donut. And you superimpose these two on top of each other. And what this donut laser does is it basically forces your uh, excitation here to be dumped into this red color here. So it comes out this fluorescence in the red color, and you put a filter in front of your detector, which only allows you to see green light. 
And so what you end up is just seeing this little spot in the middle. And what's fantastic about this is that uh, in this little spot in the middle, um, the way this spot is made, it's very, uh, the intensity profile is very nonlinear. So as I turn up the intensity of my uh, laser here, this spot becomes smaller and smaller. And in principle, I have unlimited resolution. I can get this. In, in practice, in, in diamonds, you can get down to a resolution of about 2 nanometers. But if you try doing this in any living sample, it, you would have burned it away. I think in the interest of time, uh, let's stop here and thank you all.